You good? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. It's Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. It's 6.30 in the evening, and we're all in person again. It's good to see Yay. everybody, uh, everybody's real life face, and to see people in the audience. And uh, welcome back, everybody. It's nice to see folks. Um, you have the minutes for the June 22nd uh, meeting in front of you, and do they meet with your approval? I move to approve the minutes as received. I'll second that. And I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, motion carries. And I forgot to say for the record that the council members are all here and present. So Karen now officially has that in the record. Is there any visitor comment? I see nobody jumping up to the front, so we're gonna move promptly forward. Um, first thing I get to talk about tonight, uh, we're gonna be making a good neighbor award to the Independence Day's commission and I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things before I ask uh, Karen to read the, the citation. Um, the work of the Independent States Commission has for some three decades. It's always a Herculean task to put on an event for tens of thousands of people for uh, uh, multiple days. As a person who's chaired that group and been a volunteer uh, many years ago, I do have a personal understanding of what it takes to do that. And these past two years have been exceptionally difficult. And with changing rules, with changing situations, things changing on almost a weekly basis. And I just want to, most of our commission, well, our, our commissions and boards are generally policy, but this commission gets down and dirty. They're actually out doing it and you've made a wonderful impact both last year when you created uh, the little pods all over the community that were so special that people loved that took hellacious amounts of work <laughs> I really appreciate that and then for you, you folks this year to in with changing environments to be able to pull off a wonderful event uh, in the park and fireworks that I've never seen people so happy to see. And so I just want you to, to know how much I personally appreciate it. Now I'm gonna ask City Recorder Johnson to read the official citation that, uh, that goes with this and then we're gonna make some awards. So Ms. Johnson, to you please. For most of 2020 and almost all of 2021 so far, COVID-19 changed the way we live and socialize. This new construct affected so much of what we do and how we do it. To say that Independence Day's Commission was tested this year and last would be an understatement. The Independence Day's Commission, led by Chair Janice, Janice Thompson, had to reimagine our community's 4th of July celebration. Last year, while under strict guidelines from the governor and the CDC, the usual celebration morphed into several block parties scattered throughout the city, complete with food vendors and carnival-style games. It wasn't perfect, but to hear folks say, I'm so glad my kids have something to do outside. And thanks for working so hard to safeguard our community, but still finding safe ways for us to acknowledge the holiday. Made it all worthwhile. This year posed a different problem. Restrictions were eased, but only gradually, forcing the commission again to fall back from the usual and stage something resembling the norm. Again, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't what everyone had hoped for, but our local business owners and volunteers chipped in to help generate buzz and sell wristbands, and the commission got it done. It's been said many times, nothing happens in independence without volunteers. And the Independence Day's commission is chock full of the most amazing volunteers. Many of the commissioners have been working on Independence Day for years, and know how, no matter how hard of a job it is to pull off, they keep coming back for more. <laughs> Janice Thompson, the ringleader, has a family and a very demanding full-time job. Nathan Jr. and Lisa Cox are local business owners who literally drop just about everything to arrange for entertainment and food and craft vendors. The public works and police departments, represented by Aaron Weimer and Sergeant Juventino Banuelos, add on Indie Day's responsibilities to their already full list of official duties. They coordinate park setup, vendor support, signage, traffic control, and security before, during, and after the event. Karen Johnson, our tireless city reporter, <laughs> <laughs> schedules all the commission meetings and records the minutes. 
But that's not all. She's also the volunteer coordinator for the commission and staffs tables at the event every year. Natasha Adams, the newest commissioner, but no stranger to volunteering, is a full-time mom and state employee and worked hard this year to jumpstart a fledgling social media and communications pro program. Deputy Fire Chief Neil Olson provides invaluable support from Polk County Fire District 1. His involvement ensures fire safety, so important in our hot, dry summers, and is at the top of our priority list. And there are so many more. Vicki McCubbin, who sits on the Independence Downtown Association Board, co coordinated local business engagement this year. Keith Aldrich, our fireworks contact, ensured that the long-awaited fireworks display was everything we hoped it would be. Stacy Strader, a longtime volunteer, arranged for dedicated volunteer support at the gates. Kimber Townsend, organized CERT to provide any needed assistance and, in the absence of the chair, facil facilitated meetings. Her institutional knowledge helps to ensure every contingency is covered. And Shannon Core, who devoted countless volunteers' hours in various capacities, taking care of the risk grant program, delivering them to businesses, tracking sales, etc., and helping with volunteer coordination, just to name a few. The bottom line, Independence Day is hard to pull off, but has been especially challenging these last two years. All of Independence is ready for Independence Day to get back to what we know and love about it. But before planning next year can start, it's important to say a well-deserved thank you to the entire commission and adjunct members for their perseverance, hard work, and commitment to supporting our wonderful community. They are indeed all good neighbors. Shannon, you need to be down there too. Oh, you're going to make him bring it to you? <laughs> wow, framed in everything. <laughs> you really do deserve it. Congratulations. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Very impressed. Thank you. Congratulations, Jan. Thank you for your work. Natasha, does Abigail know yet that this is a life assignment? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Councilor Kaur is the uh, liaison for this group. Yeah, I just want to say a few things. Um, I'm not sure my help helped or hurt the event, quite honestly. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm math challenged, and they gave me a math job. So hopefully next year I won't have a math job. But I just wanted to say that um, it's an honor working with all of you. You were just amazing. I'm, I'm just floored by your professionalism and your dedication to this community, truly. I know how busy you are in your real lives, so it's a great thing to have you do this. Um, I also wanted to say that we have commissions, committees, and boards so that we can augment the city staff and do the work of the city. Um, 
it's very important that we use these commissions to do these kinds of jobs because not only do we help the city get things done, we also provide an opportunity for the public to get involved. So it's very important to have these and I, I, I am just absolutely honored and floored by your work. Thank you so much for what you do. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna keep moving forward, if that's okay. Folks, you're welcome to stay, but I know there may be other, I think Abigail has some more fun things he would probably be more interested in doing, but uh, whatever works is fine. Thank you very much. We, so I'm gonna continue with my mayor's report just to, to keep you folks informed. I've had the opportunity in the last couple of weeks to meet more with additional congressional staff uh, continuing to push the Highway 2251 project, continuing to keep that in front of them. And so now when uh, uh, congressional staff and U.S. Senators see me, they go, yes, we know about Highway 22 and 51. And so uh, they're working on that. Had the opportunity recently, along with Sean Irvine, to give uh, uh, business tours to, uh, to some folks that uh, were very interested in our community, and uh, I'm hopeful and we'll just see how things roll, and I really appreciate Sean's efforts. Had a chance to also take our new chamber executive, um, uh, Nikki Marazzani, and I just called her Nikki, and she had a convertible, and we had the top down, and we drove around town, and I got a chance to show her the different things that were going on in Independence, which uh, uh, were very interesting to her because there's lots of things that uh, she wasn't aware of. Also want to let you know that I will be attending the Oregon Mayor's Association um, conference uh, later in July. I'm a past president of that organization and so we'll be attending uh, that later on in the year. Um, with that, I'm going to move forward and have Mr. Pesimir give his city manager report. Mr. Pesimir, to you please. So uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, it is good to be back in person um, and uh, to be uh, talking about things. I, I don't have a long report uh, today, but I did kind of want to preview a couple things that are going to be coming up on a policy level, um, just so you don't get surprised. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is House Bill 3115, which passed here recently. Um, that was the bill to uh, codify the Circuit Court of Appeals decision um, in uh, Martin versus Boise relating to local laws relate, regulating the acts of sitting, lying, sleeping, or keeping warm and dry and outdoor public places in regards to persons experiencing homelessness. So um, this was a legislation that was passed and there are certain things that we're going to need to do over time as a city to make sure that we um, stay in compliance with um, the uh, Court of Appeals decision. I'll just lead off by saying we already know we're in compliance with that. There's not an issue there. Um, but, you know, it is um, important that we uh, make sure that not only that we are staying in compliance, but that we are also um, doing everything that we can to uh, make sure that we're staying ahead of things um, in this area. So, really nothing for you do, to do tonight. Um, this isn't uh, something that becomes um, operative until July 1st of 2023. Uh, so we have lots of time, but at the same time, we feel it's important that we actually be proactive rather than reactive and make sure that we are getting out of this, in front of this. So the plan is really to, um, to, to evaluate what is in this legislation, um, have our city attorney take a careful look at it, take a careful look at what we currently have, and then to um, make uh, suggestions on how we can actually um, uh, keep up with the changing landscape regarding homelessness in our community and other communities. So this is really just a highlight, just letting you know we're aware that this legislation is out there and we're gonna be proactive about making sure that we um, are staying in front of it. Uh, the second item that is policy related is uh, related to parking conflicts. Um, we have definitely seen some parking conflicts between the apartment residents um, and the businesses uh, in the parking lot behind the Elks Club all the way over to Osprey Point. Um, that is a, a public parking lot um, with an easement over a number of properties. The city has the ability to uh, manage that. Um, and uh, that has really kind of turned in lately into being kind of an extension of parking for the apartments, which is creating conflicts for our businesses, which are just going to get worse and worse over time. So again, we're trying to be proactive um, in this area. We do have the ability to restrict overnight parking, so we could throw up parking, no parking signs, or no overnight parking signs up there um, today if we wanted. 
Uh, however, we think that would really create other problems. So we're kind of trying to find a middle ground um, where we can do something that uh, accommodates both and make sure that these conflicts are uh, not overlapping as much as possible. So we'll be looking at all sorts of things. One of the things we'll definitely be looking at is parking permits. Um, so that we'll have time limited permits potentially either in that area or down in Riverview Park um, to make sure that uh, we are able to um, go as long as we possibly can uh, to support the businesses as well as support the residents that we have. So it's uh, it'll be a little interesting um, as we try to work through that, but definitely I'm sure you probably heard about it if you haven't seen it, and it's just going to get worse over time. We know we have parking issues, and one of the things about parking permits, it could provide some funds actually for us to do this comprehensive parking study that we want to do because we probably have, you know, I, the thing that probably would be best was would be for us to take a look at a 20-year parking management plan to make sure that we have a long-term plan to deal with um, the success that downtown Independence is experiencing. So. Uh, with good news, there's always uh, challenges, and we're looking forward to taking those on. I'm guessing that we'll probably come back to you with some policy uh, discussion after we kind of uh, settle on some, some ideas to, uh, to make that work the best that we can. And obviously, we'll have some public outreach on that as well, just to make sure that we understand um, exactly how to, how to manage those waters. Uh, at the next council meeting, we are going to have the um, consultant who's been helping us with our communications plan um, come and kind of present where they're at. They still have a couple months left on the project, but we felt it important to give you guys an update. Um, we found out a lot of great information from uh, listening to people in the community about what we can do and where we can really put our efforts um, to make the most impact. So I definitely wanted them to be able to check in with you well before they were done. So it's not like, oh, we're done and here's what you're doing. It's more like uh, a communication to, to check in. Um, but we're, I, I'm personally really excited about the work they've done so far. Um, and I think they've got great suggestions for us. Um, it's going to be something that we you know, have to work on uh, over time. But um, it has been good to uh, have that um, program underway and uh, hopefully uh, you agree after the presentation on the 27th. Uh, just a couple of other things, just real quick. Um, we talked about Main Street uh, at the last meeting. Um, that is something that's here between uh, I Street and the bridge. Um, traffic control is going to be a challenge there. We have asked for their traffic control plan and we're currently reviewing it. Uh, we've also asked them to put together a proposal for night paving um, because we know that uh, uh, from what we're hearing, the paving's going to take about a week, and if we're trying to do that during the day, um, I know that they can keep one lane open uh, probably most of the time, but with, with paving trucks and stuff coming in and out and weaving, um, it can be a real disruption. So we're definitely going to evaluate that for cost effectiveness, um, but uh, unfortunately there isn't any way around that, as you guys noted at the last meeting. So there will be restricted one lane traffic for um, you know periods of time. Um, that will definitely um, be unavoidable in order to put the water lines in and to actually prep the road for for the paving. So I just want to make sure that we're keeping that in front of you and keeping it in front of the public because it will be a disruption and there will be delays um, related to that project, which are unfortunately unavoidable, but we're doing what we can to, to try to do that. We're also going to be putting up some signs here um, very soon just to give people some notice that that project is, is coming. Um, but it will be a little, little while before the contractor actually gets out there and, and begins their work. Um, just a couple last things. Um, summer Concert Series starts this Thursday um, with the movies on Thursday and the concert on Friday. Um, Sean has played a huge role in getting that up and running in Courtney's absence, so thanks to Sean for, for stepping in. I think he has a, a new appreciation for Courtney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we're excited to actually see that. Definitely be much more low-key this year. Um, we and I have bringing in the big bands that we expect to bring in the big crowds. Um, we're trying to keep it much more local and uh, just uh, still have uh, a good time, but um, not, uh, not overwhelm uh, what's going on. And then uh, just a reminder um, that I'm going to be out of the office August 3rd through the 16th. So um, taking my second daughter back to Tennessee to college. So um, I'll be gone and uh, just wanted to keep that in front of you. And then if you have any questions for me and my staff, now's the time. I did have one question. 
when we're doing the repaving down here, will there be any compromise to the bridge if paving trucks are coming over that as far as weight? I, no, I mean, we can check, but um, the, it, you bring up a good subject that um, I don't think maybe I followed up with publicly. I think we did privately, but the Marion County uh, hired a separate engineer to uh, re-rate the bridge um, and ODOT um, looked at that. And so they definitely raised the limits up above what a fully loaded uh, dump truck, um, which would be typically the type of stuff you would be having bringing the asphalt in over that bridge. So um, it would be fine. Um, and uh, okay. the good news is uh, once they recognize the trouble with the farm equipment, um, and I know Councillor uh, Roden uh, played a role in, in helping to uh, communicate with them, they actually took a second look at it and made things a lot more uh, convenient for people. So Thank you. Great. Okay. I think the next person is Mr. Irvine. Yeah, and let me kind of just introduce Please. this because we're doing something a little bit new. Um, one of the things that is really important is that periodically department managers have the opportunity to kind of talk to council about all the really hard work that they're doing because it gets lost sometimes in, in um, all of the stuff that's going on and it's gotten lost in the conversation in three years since, or two and a half years since I've been here just because every time we've had it, an opportunity to do it, whether it's at a budget meeting or uh, a retreat, we've had something else going on that's kind of interrupted that flow. So I thought the next best thing would be to actually bring in one department a month and just kind of have them kind of go through everything so it's not such a download on you and it's not such a, uh, an, a burden on them. Um, and Sean graciously offered to kick this off. Um, and so he'll, he'll kind of give you the first one, but you can kind of expect that Every, every month we'll have someone coming up and kind of talking about what uh, they're, they're going on. And it's an opportunity for you to ask questions about what, what's going on in the department as well. Some will be longer, some will be shorter, um, depending on, you know, departments. Um, but uh, definitely want to make sure that you, as well as the uh, residents in the city, know um, all the hard work that's being done by staff. So Tom, spe speaking of departments, what's going on with the Public Works Department Director? Yeah, so we still have the uh, advertisement out. Um, we haven't found a qualified candidate yet. Uh, we did get an application the other day, and I expect another one here in the next few days. So um, Ken and I have been in close contact about that. Ken is our public works. Ken Perkins is our public works supervisor. And I think we're still both on the same page. We're glad we didn't hire an interim. Um, it's been certainly a lot more work for me and for him. But at the same time, there's a continuity in systems in public works that can really get broken up um, if you bring people in and out. So uh, we're still advertising and looking, but I, there's a number of cities that are advertising and looking as well. So, okay. so. Thanks. Good evening, Sean. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be here. Um, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you a little bit about um, economic development, kind of what we do and, and, and why. I'm kind of going to do a little bit of sort of the, the not necessarily the philosophical sorry. side, but the uh, the why behind it, and then also talk about some of what, what we actually do. Um, and uh, if you got questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, you know, no, no need for me to just blather on all the way to the end uh, before taking questions. Um, so again, I'm just going to give Karen the high sign to, <laughs> to shift things over here. So traditional economic development, um, it's pretty straightforward. They call it a three-legged stool. You, they focus on recruitment, business retention, expansion, and it, you know, sometimes they, do, they just focus on entrepreneurship. Other communities um, take a, a broader approach and focus on community development, which is what we do. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, business recruitment is really the area that a lot of cities, and it's kind of the area that people think of when they think of economic development. It's going out, you know, finding a, a business and enticing them to come to the community um, through, you know, through through some means. Um, it's it, it's it's definitely a part of it. It's an important part. Um, it's very challenging because you have to know really with good good detail your infrastructure, your um, your kind of your community assets, your workforce, all of these kind of things. Because for example, I got a lead on a food processor that needed a million gallons a day of water. That's like as much wa as wa much water as the entire city uses right now. So I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time recruiting that business. Uh, you know, there and, and similarly with workforce, if it requires a specialized workforce that we don't have, there's no sense spending time on it. So it's a, it involves a lot of legwork and a lot of um, understanding. And um, what we tend to do 
you know, we want to have, we want to be ready. We tend to take a responsive approach as opposed to a proactive go out and cold call people and, and, and you know, kind of try to drum up uh, new industry. The, um, you know, we have properties in town that we make sure are available that are ready. Uh, we have one industrial property in town that's certified shovel ready. Um, so that means you can come in here and start building quickly. Um, that's attractive to, to industry. Similarly for the downtown, you know, you keep uh, kind of in touch with the property owners, the, the, the real estate folks to kind of know which properties are available and, and for how much. Um, and then really, like I say, we try to be more responsive than, than actually kind of going out and cold calling because it's a lot of, it takes a lot of time and it's a very low, low percentage return, I would say, on the time spent. Um, we, you know, if I get a call from somebody who's looking, I'm definitely responding to it. But, you know, when you think of independence versus a place like Salem, for a large manufacturer that's, that's going to, you know, have a, a large area, a lot of employees, you know, the, the benefit of being in independence versus the benefit of being in a place like Salem or Portland or Eugene, you know, it's unless there's a specific reason for them to be here or in this area, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough ask to say, hey, you know, independence is the right place for you, uh, you know, because um, you tend to hear a lot about incentives with recruitment. Um, some communities really try hard to entice businesses just by throwing money at them. Um, if it doesn't work from a business perspective, then it's not going to work no matter how much money you throw at them. Um, but again, there are some businesses that make sense for here, and so we do do some targeted recruitment. Um, you know, with MyNet, with our fiber optic system, with our rural proximity to agriculture and, and food, you know, there's some, some target areas that, we, that I kind of keep an eye out for. And um, the FCR uh, contact center, I think, is a good example of the type of recruitment that we do, which is we identify those targets like a contact center that benefits from fiber. Um, so literally saw it in a newspaper that they were trying to go into Cottage Grove. It was an Oregon, Oregon company that likes to be in small rural communities. And so I was like, okay, that's ringing all the bells. Um, and they happened to publish the president's name uh, in the, the newspaper. So, <laughs> so, and they were having trouble going to Cottage Grove. So I picked up the phone and called them and said, hey, you know, if it doesn't work out there, what about here? Um, but again, you have to kind of know a lot about the, like what they need. So like a call center, they need a lot of parking. They need a lot of people. They need a lot of bandwidth, you know, and so, you know, we're able to say, we have, you know, this great spot with a lot of parking, we've got a lot of bandwidth, we've got, you know, everything you need to make that pitch. Um, and it still took two years of kind of maintaining that relationship, talking to him, you know, didn't get, get it at that time, but he said, hey, we're, we're doing more, so maybe one of these later ones. And it's you kind of build that relationship and maintain that connection, and you might get lucky down the road. So, you know, I, I don't mean to diminish the, the, the importance of recruitment. But again, for a community like Independence, it's tough. And so we try to take a very targeted and efficient approach to recruitment, um, respond to the opportunities that really make sense. Um, and then we work with our partners at SEDCOR to kind of handle the, the more broader, just kind of going out and marketing uh, you know, the community and the region to, to these larger manufacturers. Um, and still, you know, I mean, I typically have two or three kind of prospects going at any given time, you know, some of them for years, literally, because it's just, you just call them, just check in every now and then say, hey, how's it going? Just making sure that you're still doing this and possibly interested and, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, next slide. So business retention expansion, <clears throat> any good economic development person is going to tell you that this is where you should spend most of your time, especially in a smaller community, because you're working with the businesses that are already here. And if they're already here, presumably they like being here. Uh, and if they don't like being here, you should probably figure out why and try to change that. So, um, you know, it requires, as you might expect, a lot of contact and relationship building. And you're going to hear me talk about relationship building a lot. That is the fundamental aspect of economic development, um, in particular the way we practice it. But, you know, it's a lot of just calling, emailing, going and visiting, talking to the business owners, you know, the, the foremen, the, the people in the businesses, just to just... How's it going? What are you running into? Do you have any needs? Do you have any problems? Uh, you know, what is, are, you, are you succeeding so much that you need to grow? You know, like just, just those check-ins to see, to see how things are going. And then really trying to route them to whatever can help them solve whatever need they have. You know, if they're, if they're you know, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, you know, I've got this building permit. I'm trying to, to try to do this thing and I haven't heard anything for two weeks. What's going on? That's easy. That's an easy, just poke my head into Jeff's office. You know, what's going on with this? communicate, 
uh, and things keep going. Other times, it's you know, it's things like um, connecting with consultants or classes because you know I'm growing really fast. And I don't know how to how to manage it. I need to talk to somebody who can help me kind of understand my manage my my procurement and, and sourcing of raw materials and and you know kind of scaling of my my recipe for my food product or what have you. Um, you know, we can we can we've got partners that we can connect up to to bring those those resources in. Other times, it's you know, it's money. It's a facade improvement grant. It's a uh, it's a Main Street grant that can help rehab a building. It's a it's a city revolving loan that can help them, uh, you know, kind of make the improvements they need to 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 start their business or, or grow their business. Um, <clears throat> and then other times, just connecting with a property owner again. You know, look, we're we're bursting at the seams here. We need a, a place that's got double the room. You know, and of course, I don't want you to move out of town. So let's see if we can find you somewhere else in town to go to. So it's again just a lot of that kind of ma maintaining relationships. Um, figuring out solutions to whatever problems they have, and many times they're good problems. You know, it's like I'm growing too fast. You know, how do I deal with this? Um, but it's still a problem, um, and so it's a very individualized approach um, to economic development. So the next, the third part of the stool is, is community development, and this is an area that, frankly, is pretty often neglected um, by communities. Um, because it's really easy to get focused on just that specific business piece. But you know, you're talking about entrepreneurship, startups. You're talking about quality of life. You know, a good community that people want to live in is the kind of place the businesses want to be. That they want to, their employees are going to want to live there. They're going to want to be there. You know, it, it's just got a better a better feel. It's 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 a, it's making sure your workforce is trained up and skilled up in the, the latest and greatest and knows kind of what they need to, to know to be able to secure jobs or to be able to take employment at whatever business um, is either in the area or you're trying to recruit the area. Uh, and then infrastructure as well. You know, again, if you don't have sufficient water, sufficient sewer, broadband, you know, those types of things, um, your, your businesses aren't going to be able to grow. Um, and again, that this is that, it's kind of a squishy third leg. Um, but it really, I, I think, is what kind of makes it all work. It's what, what kind of fits it all together. Because there's a lot of communities that will focus entirely on recruitment, or, you know, maybe do a little bit, bit of BRE also. But it's that holistic piece of the community itself. You know, it's good schools, it's great parks, it's, you know, kind of people that say hello to each other in the street. You know, all of that is what kind of fits in to really make that, that great whole that makes it easy to, to bring in and grow businesses to a community. So, we, if you ask any other communities in Oregon, you know, what, what kind of small towns that do good economic development, they'll talk about independence and they'll say we do things differently. Part of what makes us different is we have this vision that guides us. And it's this vision that started back in 1996 uh, with this community-wide uh, engagement process. And we've done a couple more, the, to the Vision 2020, which was done in 2008, the Vision 2040, which was just recently completed in 2020 where we go out to the community and say, you know, where do you guys want to see the community go? What do we need to do to get there? Uh, you know, we, we, that sets that North Star that then lets us, you know, sort of proceed collectively, even if we're not going exactly the same direction, we're still all going generally the same direction. Um, and that really guides our economic development work. Um, what the community has said consistently over time is, we need our downtown to be this vibrant hub of the community. It should be the place that people go to meet friends. It should be a place that they can go to shop, to eat, to have fun, to you know, to recreate. It's just it needs to be that hub of the community. And if it is that vibrant hub of the community, the rest will follow. You know, the rest of the community will will continue to develop and prosper. Um, and that's really kind of what we're working we're working towards. And the other benefit of this engagement that we do is it creates leverage. You get community members, other partner organizations, other people bought into that vision who say, I love that you know, direction, this is where we want to go to, and this is what we can do to help us get there. Um, and that, as, as a very, very small staff, you know, that helps us leverage our efforts. It, you know, if we've got an organization or an individual who's willing to do something that will also help, help the community achieve its goal, we want to support them because that gets us where we're going as well. So I mentioned we're a small team, um, and uh, it was three of us, and we're putting the time in. But you know, I want to just kind of, when I say it takes a team, they, you know, I'm really actually talking about everybody here at City Hall, um, or and actually within the city, the, the city government, I should say, because 
Every city says they're business friendly. If, you, if you're a business and you go to any city in the country and say, I want, I'm thinking about doing business in your community, they'll say, we're very business friendly. And then you go and talk to the building official or the planner or the public works people and find out that they're not that business friendly. Um, so I really have to give credit to you know, our building folks, our, you know, our planner, um, Fred, our public works department you know, is particularly there can they consistently get high marks from people about you know the the how it is to work with them um, doesn't mean that they always roll over and say yes you know we play by the same rules as everybody else but we have a real culture of you know if I have to say no about something it's well no but here's what you can do you know or no because of these reasons and if you can fix these reasons we can we can say yes you know it's not just a no go away. Um, and that honestly is one of one of our biggest, um, I mean, recruiting benefits is people come and talk to other business owners and they say, yeah, the city, you know, the city hall is easy to work with. They're, you know, they 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 will they will help you as opposed to be a hindrance. Um, and when you you know when I'm out there saying yes, we're business friendly, yes, we're easy to work with, and then it's getting backed up by the rest of our staff, it's it's incredibly helpful. Um, and again, you know, it's it's, it's relationship business, relationship based business. I keep saying that. Um, you know, I get leads from Public Works. I get leads from the building department. You know, they're out there talking with contractors or talking with other people, and they they'll come back and say, Hey, you know, this person they're thinking about opening a business. You know, uh, that does this. It's like, nope, don't know them. Give me their phone number. So it's a it's a great give and take. Um, and then you know, you've got Courtney and Ramon uh, who, who work with me. You know, they're they're the, the, the boots on the ground. The three of us are out there just constantly talking to people. Um, it's about making connections, you know, listening, learning, asking. You know, it's just a constant process of gathering input um, from the community, but particularly from the businesses when we're talking about economic development. And then also acting as outlets for information because the business owners want to know what's going on. You know, like what's going on on the 4th of July? It's been changing every day. You know, it's, it's those, those types of things where there can be that nice give and take um, about what's going on, about opportunities for businesses, about you know what's going on with COVID, you know all of these things. That's what builds that relationship and that rapport because we want the business owners, uh, you know, to be able to essentially just feel like they can pick up the phone and call us or send us an email, ask a question, get it answered. That's what you want. Um, <clears throat> and then partner organizations. I mentioned it already, but partners make the world go round for us because we can't do it all ourselves. We need those partners to, to help us do it as well. Next. So a little bit, you know, Ramon, Ramon's a little bit of an interesting position because he's not pure economic development. He does a lot of just community engagement. Um, and it's really important work. And again, it's really individualized work. Um, he, you know, with COVID, he spun up this Zoom, uh, Latino Zoom group that, was, that met every Friday. They still meet uh, once, once a month on Friday. Great way of, of getting information out. Uh, and also, again, kind of being able to ask people, you know, what's going on? What's, what's happening with this? What about that? You know, kind of, you know, sort of pitching possibilities and getting feedback from the community. He spent a lot of time on the census. And that is an economic de development benefit because we need to know about our community, you know, what their characteristics are, where the weak spots are that we need to be focusing on and targeting. Um, and then frankly, with the census, you know, the more, the more people you count, the more federal money you get. So it's a, <laughs> there's some definite benefits there as well. Um, but he does a lot of, uh, next slide. He does a lot of individualized connections and it's really hard to kind of quantify the benefit of that because it's not like a, it's just not a easily quantified thing. But you know, when I talk about the benefits of him, he's getting at, you know, the Latino community in particular is very, they, they, they like personal relationships, individual relationships, individual communication. And he's that, that conduit for us. Uh, and it pays off in, in situations like um, the, the middle top picture there, you know, he got together with a Latina business owner who, uh, you know, kind of spoke limited, limited English and helped her fill out a COVID grant application, you know, because, you know, he wanted to make sure that he was getting out there on an individual basis to make sure everybody was accessing those, those grant opportunities for the businesses that were, that were available. Um, he's bringing leadership opportunities to the community uh, through Capas's Leadership Institute and other organizations to, um, again, get community members trained up, skilled up, um, you know, being able to help, you know, sort of be better participants in their community. 
um, you know, making individual connections, uh, for example, with St. Patrick's Church, being able to kind of bridge, bridge that connection between the folks doing COVID vaccines in the church so they could have a COVID uh, vaccination event at the church, you know, with the Spanish mass so they can, they can target the Latino community. Um, just all of those things really, it, again, it doesn't, it's hard to quantify, but it makes it easy to be flexible. It makes it easy to move quickly. It makes it easy to, to be innovative because we can just say, hey, Ramon, do you have somebody who can do this? Or do you know somebody who is a connection for that? And he can just pick up the phone and call them. Um, and all of this, again, you know, Ramon's a, you know, a little bit of a 50-50 in terms of economic development, but I really believe that this engagement aspect is a part of economic development, an engaged community is critical to a, you know, a community that's truly business friendly, that, that truly has good economic development prospects because you feel like you can be involved and engaged um, and see your dreams succeed, frankly. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I said it before, we do things a little differently here. Um, and when Ramon and Courtney and I are getting together to talk projects, we really try to prioritize things, uh, projects and events that achieve multiple goals or create multiple impacts. And again, we're kind of guided by that community vision of revitalizing the downtown and supporting local business. But it's like, and then what? What else can we do? How else can we, can we leverage this? So, you know, we're also trying to eventually build both community and economy. Um, so, you know, it's not just about getting dollars into the businesses. It's about creating opportunities for the community to interact with each other, to, for the community to, to be special. Uh, and so you know, we're trying to create spaces for interaction, for people to have fun, you know, enhance that quality of life, but that also generates spending for local businesses. Um, you know, and again, kind of always like, how does this help the downtown? So the Airstream rallies that we did a couple of years, that's a great example. It was a, you know, bring, bring a bunch of Airstreams, park them down on Main Street. It looks cool. It's really neat. They're offering tours. It also brings a lot of people downtown. And, the, you know, the Airstream people themselves would go and, and, and eat in the restaurants and, and shop in the stores. So that brings money. Um, you know, we're, with partners, we're working with the Downtown Association, IDA, uh, frequently on these types of projects to, to essentially just keep having these events, these activities that will both create a sense of community but also, um, you know, have an economic impact. Uh, so Ramon led a, I think, a great example of this, which is the, the Bike Indie Project and the Drop the Hammer Weekends. We've done a lot with, with bicycle tourism and bike infrastructure the last several years, putting in repair stations, a bike, biker boat or campground, things like that. Um, and Ramon's a big biker, if you don't know. Uh, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so he spearheaded this idea of creating bikeindieoregon.com, which is a, a place that people looking to go ride their bikes in the area can find routes uh, and information about you know, where to stay and things to do. Um, and then he, we, he created, or we, we all created, we worked together on this, um, Drop the Hammer Weekends, which is a once a quarter, you know, sort of, it's a community thing. It's, it's get anybody who wants to come ride a bike come on Saturday or Sunday, and there's three or four different rides you can take of different lengths, depending on your ability, um, and you just get together and ride them. And then, and then you kind of have a little celebration at the end. And again, there's, there's everything from a three mile in town ride to, ride to a, it was like an 85 mile, you know, crazy person ride. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's about accessibility. It's about you know, anybody who wants to, and it draws from far. Like we have people from Portland, we actually had a, couple people from Seattle that came, um, you know, so you're pulling 90 to 100 people each of these weekends. We've done three so far. Some, you know, many of them have never been to the community before, so you're getting that, you know, kind of new people to town, spending money. Um, and then the extra piece was we created this, this Bike Indie Pass, and this was kind of Ramon's brainchild. He went around to all the businesses and said, hey, if somebody comes in and shows this Bike Indie Pass, would you give them a discount of some type? Um, and it's all kind of online and automated, so it's, it's easy. Um, and it gives sort of a benefit for anybody who's riding a bike in town. Um, you know, if you're riding a bike, you, you got a bike indie pass, you can, you know, get discounts at any of, I think it's now eight uh, downtown businesses. So it's, again, kind of a way to draw people into the, down, to the businesses and then hopefully get them coming back. You know, you've got the event weekend once a quarter and hopefully they're going to come back sometime, you know, else and, you know, before the next event and go to those, go to those businesses and, and shop in the places. Um, and then, you know, incorporating other things, like there was a helmet giveaway at the last one. Um, Ramon's done a couple of other uh, bike, uh, kind of community bike safety events, those types of things. Uh, he's organizing the Oregon Hop Run, which is another great kind of both community and tourism draw. 
Um, and then he's also uh, worked with an event promoter to bring the Hophead 100, which is a new, new bike event that's going to be coming to the community in, in October. Um, so he's really been getting engaged in that, that side of things. So you know, you've, you've seen this slide um, before, but I, thought, I think it bears repeating. You know, again, what's our focus? We're trying to support local businesses, especially downtown businesses. Um, you know, that's our vision. That's our kind of our, our imperative. And then how do we create leverage to create more impact? You know, we've got this plaza with COVID. We put the, 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 the picnic tables out there. We put the, the, the cafe lights to make the sort of outdoor dining area to encourage people to come downtown and eat. When we did the drive-ins, we, we, we did an ad reel before the movies so we can, we can do ad. We, we made our own ads for the downtown businesses so that people get an idea. And if you brought um, food or a receipt from a, a local business to the movies, uh, you got entered in a raffle for a free night at the hotel. You know, again, encouraging people, you know, okay, not just have a, a community event of the movie, or a community event that we're gonna encourage people to also spend money in, in local restaurants. And then, you know, in continuing, you know, again, that, that, that idea of building community and economy. You know, we have a pumpkin patch event, you know, in the, in the park so people can do it, can, can pick pumpkins but we put five indie bucks on each one that could be spent in any downtown business. So we're encouraging people, hey, you got a pumpkin, now you got $5 free, let's go get you into a downtown business, and then hopefully you'll spend more than $5. Um, the Glow event, you know, just again, a great, easy thing that's accessible to everybody because we want the whole, you know, that's another imperative from the vision is get everybody able to access these things, able to enjoy them. Um, but it's a, it's a way to get people downtown when they normally don't want to be outside because it's usually you know kind of December time frame that um, it's rainy and cold and people don't want to be outside. And then of course the scratch it's you know that was a big success. Um, and it, again just kind of a, it's great community. You know people see it and like that's cool. Like it's like they're they're proud to be in a place that does that kind of stuff. That's that's a great community thing. And it also was a big benefit to, to the businesses. You know in addition to the 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 scratch it dollars that the businesses got. Um, we asked the businesses to track, you know, how much money was spent, like the total ticket that the scratch it was spent on. Um, and we had eight of them do it in the last one and uh, found that the, typically for every dollar of scratch it that went out, the businesses got $5 of total, you know, in terms of the total ticket. So it wasn't just somebody spending a $5 scratch it on a $5 beer, it was $5 scratch it on a $25 meal or something like that. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the, the caveat with all of this is it all takes a lot of time to organize these things. Um, you, know, and, you know, Tom kind of alluded to that I've been missing Courtney. Um, you know, she was out on, on maternity leave and, um, you know, you probably may have noticed that we haven't done a ton of, of promotions the last couple of months. It's because we just don't have the, the capacity to without her around. Um, and so I'm, I am very happy to have her back because when you think about it, even the scratches, which is a relatively easy, you know, uh, program, just collecting the scratches from each business, there was 23 businesses. So if you, you know, figure 15 minutes per business, you know, that's the better part of a day right there. And then you still gotta factor in off, you know, when they're open, when they're not, things like that. So it, it really sucks up time quickly doing a lot of these things, um, but it's worth it. Uh, next one. So the River's Edge, you know, Tom mentioned it, we're, we're really excited again. You know, this was one of these, we built an amphitheater, a lot of cities would have just kind of stopped there and we said, no, we want to, we need to activate it. We need to do something that's going to be great for the community and it's also going to be great for the businesses. And so we've successfully grown the River's Edge uh, Summer Series to what it is uh, today and we're really excited to be getting it started again because, you know, in addition to being a boon to the downtown businesses and the local food carts that are at the, the event, um, you know, it's a recruitment tool. I mean, I can't tell you how many business prospects I've talked to that's, that said they go to the concerts. You know, like, yeah, I've been going to those concerts. Like, it's been great watching what's going on downtown. Like, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to move my business here. You know, that's, I have that conversation regularly. It puts a great face on the community. Um, it also requires a lot of coordination. Um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and just, 
but you know that's what that's what it takes to to do it well. Um, and again, you know, I want to just kind of make a quick shout out to Public Works because they do a ton of behind the scenes work uh, for summer series, especially for Fourth of July, but for a lot of the events and activities um, that go on. You know, the flower baskets, putting them up, things like that, that they just never get credit for. And um, I talk to a lot of my colleagues from other communities, and I tell them the things that our public works department does. And they're just like, your public works guys do that? Like, that's, that's amazing. Uh, you know, they really are, I mean, our, our secret weapon for, you know, for independence being what it is, and especially for the events that go on. They're, they are really, really, really special. Um, you know, and frankly, the police department as well. They're, they're great about working with us, engaging ahead of time, making sure everything is, is coordinated and secure and safe and just it's it's great to have you know like i said a while ago the the team aspect of this you know we all have our part to play um and we all work really well together or most of the time we're pretty well together um but we all you know it's we're all kind of in it with this same vision of where we're going and what we're trying to achieve so tourism um, that's an area another area that's important and, and a lot of economic development folks tend to ignore uh, but that's bringing people from outside the area to spend money, uh, and that's essentially traded sector industry, which is the name of the game. Um, we, again, working with partnerships, uh, the, uh, we've got tourism is one of these things that, you know, no one small community has enough to entertain somebody for multiple days, so it's better to work collaboratively and kind of pool your assets and promote yourselves as a region to bring people to the area. So. In this case, we've got a partnership with the three cities of the county um, and a bunch of other businesses and chambers called the Polk County Tourism Alliance to promote the region, uh, as, you know, explore Polk County um, through Travel Salem um, to, to bring visitors to the area. Um, in, for a couple of years, we were able to fund a, a full-time staff person to actually kind of do a lot of this work because it's one of these things that's just like everything. You need somebody to do that work, that work to actually get it done, chase down all those details. Um, and that unfortunately fell off with COVID, but uh, if all goes well, um, you know, the three cities have committed to refunding that position in the county we're going to be approaching shortly. Um, and we really hope to bring that position back because it's one of those things that, again, it just, you need somebody who's focused on doing this um, to, you know, so that, because we all got our own stuff to focus on right now. <laughs> um, next slide. The, but, you know, the idea is, you got to bundle your assets, you know, so the Great Oaks Food Trail is the most recent project. Um, Courtney's done a lot of work with that as well as a lot of other partners where we've got anybody who has a locally grown food product, a locally grown, locally made, restaurants that source food locally, um, you know, breweries, uh, wineries, you know, all kind of packaged together as this food trail that's, that's roughly in, that is roughly in Polk County. But, um, Again, you've got, you need the person, the Polk County person to be doing that piece of the work. You also need the local person to feed the information up. So Courtney did a lot of legwork for the food trail, talking to local businesses, hey, you, you would qualify for this. You know, we need your information. We need to, get, you know, to fill out this application form. We need your hours. We need your website. You know, all of those little details um, that are, you know, not super difficult, but just take forever to get together and get organized and get get moving but it it just you know we need to feed that you know, we sort of created this marketing machine that runs up to sort of the regional and state level but we need to feed our stories into that marketing machine they're not going to do it for us and that's really what we're what we're trying to do entrepreneurship um it's it's really important um it's you know in addition to working with the businesses that are already here uh, it's important, There's, you, know, you need people starting new businesses because they're the ones that are gonna grow and hire more people. Um, for us, it's really about building an ecosystem, a place where people feel like, if I have a business idea, if I want to start a business, I know where to go to get the information I need to start my business. I know kind of who to talk to, who can help me grow my business. Um, you know, just, I know that the business owners who are here will work with me to collaborate and, and, uh, and all of us grow our businesses together um, because being a small town, we all gotta be working together here. And it's, it's interesting, even um, a lot of uh, 
the, you know, you think of, for example, restaurants, you know, if, if somebody goes to this restaurant, then that means the other restaurant's losing a customer. No, if you've got a bunch of restaurants together, that's a cluster, that's a, that's a destination. And somebody who will go to one restaurant will see that other restaurant and say, oh, I gotta go, go by and check that place out next time I come to town. You know, and so there's opportunities for even businesses that seem seemingly are competitors to work together uh, to kind of promote, uh, do, do joint promotions. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's a, that vision about support, you know, revitalizing the downtown, supporting local businesses, um, working with a partner, you know, Indie Commons, uh, the Indie Idea Hub nonprofit that's, that's spun out of it, um, you know, doing things like meetups. We ran an event called Fail Fest, which has been a lot of fun celebrating failure because, you know, you always learn more from failure than you do from success. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, you know, pop-up business fair at the church. But it's really about kind of pulling people out who are interested in starting businesses, getting them connected into the, into the resources and into the scene, basically, getting them talking to each other and engaging with each other. Um, and then, you know, there's other partners as well, with Merit, the Small Business Development Center. All of that kind of collectively helps, you know, us, you know, expand our efforts because we don't have the time to do it all of ourselves. Um, the technical assistance program um, during uh, the last fall and during COVID is a great example of this. Um, it's, it's business retention and expansion. Um, you know, working with India Idea Hub as a partner because they did a lot of the work, most of the work, um, but they served 30 local businesses, connecting them with consultants to help them do a very specific thing that helped their business um, in the process. Got a lot of great information about where their business was in terms of you know, in terms of as, as a business and what they needed to succeed, what else they might need. Got a lot of them connected to each other. Um, and then also the consultants that we use were local consultants. So many of the business owners are still in touch, either working with on a fee basis or working with on a volunteer basis, those same consultants who are helping them continue to, to grow and expand that in whatever initiative that they started. Um, so that's been a great one. Um, you know, and again, you know, going back to Ramon, he's, He's, he helped a lot with that outreach, getting, you know, getting that information out to the local businesses. Um, right now, the India Idea have just wrapped up a business survey, surveyed 24 local businesses to just kind of get an idea of, again, where things are at, how they're, are, are they confident, are they not confident, you know, what, what, what kind of barriers do they see? Uh, Ramon did six of those interviews in Spanish with, with, uh, with Latino business owners uh, because we want to make sure that we're, we're getting that, that well-rounded perspective of, you know, who the business owners are, what they need, uh, where they see things going. Uh, next one. Um, so, you know, the smart ag and technology innovation, this is something that I've talked about for, for quite a while, and it's, it's actually a great success that is something we started um, because of the broadband initiative, um, trying to be this kind of this interface for, uh, between technology and agriculture to, to create new, new companies, new jobs, make farmers more competitive. Um, that's worked well enough that SEDCOR has actually kind of taken it and run with it, and it makes more sense as a regional thing anyways, um, you know, as opposed to the city doing it. But they're, um, they got a big, big federal grant, and they're actually working on, um, on field trials right now for several companies that would be coming here and working with a local farmer to pilot a new technology that will make them more competitive and potentially be a, a technology that can scale. Um, and. Uh, and then they're also doing things like design sprints to help people generate new ideas, learn more about agriculture, get more interested in developing agricultural uh, companies. And it's, you know, that's gonna be happening out of Indi uh, Indie Commons. So we're, even though we've kind of handed that baby off, we're still deeply involved and frankly reaping the benefits of, you know, being the, the hub of this activity where the, the meetups and the, the design sprints and those kinds of things are gonna be happening here at Independence. So we get that reputation where, you know, if you're talking about agricultural technology, if you're talking about agricultural innovation, you're saying, yeah, you, you know, independence is the place to go, and independence is the place to check out if you want to plug into that scene. So um, a few, just kind of a preview of things that are coming. Um, there's, a, you know, we've been screaming busy and have even more, even more going on. Um, and again, it has to do with partnerships. So there's the new shared use commercial kitchen uh, over at Indie Commons. We're gonna be working to build out more programming um, to help the entrepreneurs that are, they're already starting to use that. There's I think six of them that are, that are, are using the kitchen now. Um, and uh, so you know, kind of how do we build out more <coughs> programming to celebrate food entrepreneurship, get people excited about it, thinking about it, um, and then support the ones who are actually taking the positive steps towards starting food-based businesses. Um, 
the Indy Idea Hub was actually uh, uh, just announced as one of the initial cohort of four in the Ford Family Foundation's new GROW initiative, which is called, which is Growing Rural Oregon. Um, and it's a five-year program to uh, uh, essentially establish entrepreneurial ecosystems in rural communities. So it's gonna help us continue to, to, to grow uh, the, uh, <laughs> our entrepreneurship uh, programming and support uh, in this community. Again, trying to keep, get, keep everything connected and working together. Um, there's a, an AmeriCorps VISTA is going to be arriving uh, on Saturday uh, to start working with India Idea Hub on digital skilling um, for community members. So, you know, this is, this is an area that we've really been interested in when you talk about workforce and community. It's not just about bringing, you know, we could import a bunch of high-wage techie guys and all of a sudden it looks like independence is a great high-wage community, but if we haven't worked with the people who already live here and helped them acquire new skills and new jobs, that pay better, then we haven't really done anything. Uh, and so that's what this is about, is working with folks, you know, who <coughs> have no digital skills, you know, here's an email address, here's how you use email, but also helping people understand how to access online jobs and, you know, how to gain the skills needed to access those <coughs> jobs, as well as working with area employers to say, you know, okay, you might be a mill, you might be a, you know, I don't know, a dentist office, what are, the, what are the digital skills, the computer skills that you need your you know, entry level people or your sort of next step up people to have? And now, okay, let's develop a program to, to teach those skills to folks in the community so they can access those jobs. Um, because it's really, you know, you, it's one thing to bring the jobs, it's another thing to actually get people you know, plugging into them. Um, we've developed a new uh, visitor oriented website called experienceindyoregon.com. Um, that's been the last uh, several months of work um, doing, developing content and, and look. Um, you probably haven't seen anything about it because it's literally, we just went live with it on the web like last week and haven't started promoting it yet, but it's, it's intended to be something that's both for community members and visitors um, where, you know, it's sort of um, story ideas about of things to do, itineraries, and, you know, if you're coming to the hotel and kind of feeling like, well, what is there to do in independence? That's what this website is for. It's also intended to be a little bit of a window into independence itself. We've got a section called Our Independence, um, and it's you know, interviews with business owners. It's um, you know, kind of a story behind the scenes of different things, just so people get a, a, a feel for what independence is and what makes it tick, uh, and what makes it special, really. Uh, and then lastly, the, uh, the American Rescue Plan. Um, that is, at some point, gonna, gonna come down the money for that. And that's going to be a ton of work. Um, you know, I'm really, really, really excited about it because there's a lot of really cool things that we can do um, and a lot of ideas that we are, we've already had uh, and a lot of great partnerships that I think we can leverage. Um, but that's going to be one where I think we're definitely, especially you look at, you know, this list of what we're already doing and what's already upcoming, we are rapidly going to run out of um, people capacity to do all of the, the, the things that we want to do. Business owners. So what do, you, what do you think about that? As we grow, how do we continue to do this kind of service? That's an interesting question. I was actually, uh, one of our partners from Tennessee for the Ag Innovation was in town yesterday. We actually were having this exact conversation, you know, how do you scale relationships? And, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm honestly not sure of the answer to that. I mean, because ultimately it's people. You need people actually out there Talk, you, know, you can't do it with an email blast. You can do it sort of with an email blast, but it's not as effective as somebody actually out there talking. So I don't have a great. I mean, well, I'm glad you're thinking of it, though. That's that's good. That's the first step, I guess. So um, my second question is um, the smart ag and tech innovation. Do you think this is something that maybe the climate commission can support? Maybe um, I guess. The, because I mean there are there, there's climate change is definitely a, a a significant aspect or or kind of area that technology is interested in with regard to agriculture and there's a mm -hmm. lot of agricultural practices that can be beneficial in that in that context. Um, I guess I don't know enough about what the climate. You kind well, of we haven't quite stood it up yet either. That's yeah. the, <laughs> the other part of the the equation. But I just it just. It just ticked my, my mind a little bit. And the last one, um, this digital skilling for community members. 
Um, is, how will that work in a practical level? Is that actually just for business owners to participate in, or are you talking about the entire community, residents and all? This would be residents and all. This, okay. would be, this would be essentially working with the businesses to identify skills that are needed, uh, as well as potential work experience opportunities, um, and then basically building a program to, to teach those skills. Um, the, we're, we're also working with the Lama Workforce Partnership that has some, some curriculum and some, um, some programming already developed around this. But you know, the, the end idea, I've seen some of these types of programs before, and it works much better when you've got a job at the end, you know, to kind of dangle out there to say, hey, mm -hmm. and, just, and we're, not, we're not necessarily looking at like the, the sort of the six month code camps or anything like that. That's sort of the next level. If somebody's interested in that, we'll kind of be able to send them to you know, whatever makes sense there. But what we want to do is say, here's these various jobs that are either in demand or here's these, you know, five or 10 employers that are actively hiring for these different positions with these different skills. You know, here's a one week, one month program. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet that will give you those skills. And ideally, we want to have those employers sort of promise to at least interview somebody who has completed the course. That's, that's the idea. Um, you know, everything will come out in the wash, so to speak, uh, once we actually get going on it. But, um, and then, then, of course, the, the, the other side of it is just kind of that delivering the basic skills of, you know, if you don't even know how to Google, if you don't know how to turn on a computer, um, let's get you at least proficient in some of those basic skills because, I mean, we've heard from, from some farmers about, you know, I got this new seed sorter and it runs off of an iPad and I handed, handed the iPad to my, you know, 30-year worker and he just was like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's like, that, that's an opportunity. I feel the same way about my city iPad, but it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Roden, I think you had some questions. So, um, Gosh, there's so many times I want to interrupt you, and I had to just stay calm because, like, I wanted to know the results of the survey you took, and I wanted to know the results of these meetings, and I wanted to know what concrete things happen when we have these meetings to help people in downtown. So do you see that there is an issue with business turnover between the 18th and 24-month mark in businesses? And how do we stop that from happening? So, yeah, so that's a... I mean, that's a fairly well-established danger zone for businesses generally is, you know, you start up a business and then the first, the first couple of years are your most dangerous, or your most likely to fail time. Um, you know, we're, we, we have some reasonably, you know, at least we've, we've got some businesses that have made it past that, that two-year point. But we have a really high turnover. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there is always gonna be some turnover, I think, what was interesting in the, the survey results were still kind of, we've got a guy tabulating it essentially to sort of finalize the, or sort of formalize the, the report. But the interesting thing that we heard, especially with COVID was first off that the business owners really, really truly appreciated the support of the community and not, not dollar support, but like the, 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 the residents coming in and saying, we're so happy you're open, we're so happy you're here. Uh, and that literally for some of them said that was why I stuck it out. Um, they all seem to be on the upswing, you know, in terms of, you know, getting, getting better. Um, the, the other thing we heard that was really interesting was they really wanted more, more opportunities to, um, informal opportunities to learn from each other. Uh, there, they, this has brought many of our business owners closer together, um, to kind of, you know, talking to each other, learning from each other. Um, and a bunch of them have said that, you know, you know, I don't know anything about social media, but I talked to John over at Crush, and he kind of got me sorted out and got me started. And then, you know, the technical assistance program got them kind of rolling to the next step. And so there's, um, the, you know, a lot of like those kind of things I think are very promising, um, and because that's frankly what we want to encourage is to build that sense of community. So I, I should have prefaced this by saying I've gone to downtown communities, and they have nine times out of ten or better have appreciated the support you've given them and how welcoming you've been. So I appreciate that and thank you for that. Um, but in our community, we need to be able to um, have events more than once a quarter and that reach you know 100 people. We need to have events that bring in thousands of people because all these businesses are now to the point where they're really excited to see people, but they can't pay their bills. And so we need to get foot traffic into these places. So. What do these things that you're doing um, get people through people's doors, more people in through their doors? So I think that's, 
that's where, frankly, the partnerships come in. Is where you know we're trying to work with Ida and uh, you know other, you know anybody who wants to do events to try to, you know, it, it's events, especially large events like that, are. I mean, they're they're challenging to organize. It, it takes a lot of a lot of time and effort. So, you know, we're in a lot of ways trying to start small and grow because um, it's also tough to hit those big events. You know, right off the bat. Um, I think you see that with the summer series where it started, you know, we were pulling 100, 200 people for several years until we kind of changed things and, and were able to start growing it. Um, so I think that's largely the, pro the approach that we've taken. Um, you know, the other side of it is, you know, trying to work with the business owners to best be able to take advantage of, of the events that are already happening. Because um, I know that's, that, that can be a challenge. Um, so I mean, I, I don't have a great answer for you. It's you know, but it's you know, things like the you know, the scratch it, scratch it campaign and the you know, the, the pumpkin patch downtown. It's it's just we're we're trying to identify, I mean, frankly, easy wins that that won't take you know half a year's worth of effort to to get go to get going. Right. Um, or if we can work with like Ida, you know, with the Hop and Heritage Festival to get that back up to to somewhere that it, that it used to be. Well, and my last thing, and then I'll stop. Is is I think we need to look bigger to get people thriving past the 18th and 24 month mark. And I know I've said this repeatedly, but I would really appreciate it if we could really take a hard look at developing the sports park. Because I really feel that in conjunction with the music and the uh, movies in the park, we could bring in not 100 people a quarter, we could bring in thousands of people on a weekend. And so I really would like that to be a focus because I think that in itself could make business turnover a lot less in downtown Independence and really make not just the people in our community struggle to pay their bills, but to thrive in paying their bills. Additional questions, please. Um, I had a question. I, I think it's fantastic that you and your team go into the small businesses and specifically downtown. How do you pick and choose which businesses to go into um, it seems like it's kind of this it's the same I know there's not a ton of businesses but um, are there businesses that are being left out are there businesses that you guys don't want to work with um, how is that handled we, we try to at least hit <clears throat> so like if there's going to be a promotion like the scratches or something like that we we try so the, the first one it was literally like a three-day turnaround before we had to get it ordered so we just sent out an email blast and the first you know whoever responded by by those that by the third day that was who was in um, in future ones we tried to actually get into at least every business and say hey are you interested um, you know do you want to participate and that's that's kind of the way we try to do it is say here's what's going on are you interested do you want to participate um, some things lend themselves better to, to certain businesses than others you know so uh, you know I mean, the food trail, you know, professional services business isn't going to be on the food trail. So we usually, you know, we might might skip the business for something like that. Um, I was going to say something else. And I totally forgot what I, what I was going to say. Um, so I think, um, so yeah, I, mean, I think in general, we try to focus on, you know, locally owned, um, you know, that, that's sort of the, the, the main criteria. Is, is it a locally owned business? Um, you know, we tend to, to, to leave the chains alone. Um, and then is it sort of on brand or on mission for whatever the thing is? So if it's a restaurant oriented thing, we're talking to restaurants and food operations. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, sometimes we miss people. Um, you know, we've had a few snafus in that regard, but um, you know, we do try to at least get in front of everybody. Okay. And you talk to businesses outside the downtown zone as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, so for you know the scratchets, we did end up uh, expanding that um, to include you know Starduster and um, uh, San Antonio. Yeah. yeah, and then we actually did talk to I think I think Courtney went into every every you know locally owned restaurant and just some of them didn't feel like didn't want to participate. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, and I'm just going to add that uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you and other staff people, and uh, um, as we've recruited encouraged and uh you never know when you're going to meet did you want to uh, say anything about some of the new businesses that are coming into our community are you able to talk about that i mean i can i can name them i'm definitely not able to say when they're going to open because i don't know <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah so there's the um the hearts compass which is opening in yeah, I, I call it the w building the one um, kind of across from the the thai place 
Um, they're actually up, up, sort of upgrading from the, uh, the farmer's market. And they actually, by the way, told me that um, the grants they got for, through the COVID relief is part of, part of why they were able to, to, to think about moving into a permanent location like that. So that's a great, a great win there. Um, and then there's, there's four other ones. There's, there's the Hi-Ho and the Crooked Skillet um, over in the Cooper building, the, kind of the big restaurant portion there. Um, the the, the hi-ho apparently is going to be kind of dinner and the crooked skillet is going to be a kind of breakfast and lunch but all sort of served in the same the same place um, there is Jana wine studio which is kind of a, uh, more, sounds like it's gonna be more of a bottle sales with a little bit of tasting and a little bit of food um, that's in the old indie common space um, sounds like that's going to open sometime in August uh, so we'll say August 31st and uh, and then um, the uh, cowbell indie uh, which is uh, over in the old Burgers and Breakfast place, or Breakfast and Burgers. Um, they're apparently going to be getting open hopefully very soon. Um, they definitely were targeting July. Um, and that's going to be a breakfast and lunch uh, location. And then Independence. Oh, and then Independence Pies. You're right, I knew I was forgetting yes. one. Um, so Independence Pies, which I love the, the idea. It's a meat pie, sweet pie, and pizza pie. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's in the old, the old um, uh, three-legged dog Donatello space. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, I think they're looking to get open reasonably soon as well, although I'm not entirely sure when for that one. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to make a detailed presentation. I think it was uh, informative for all of us. Great. Really Happy appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. Happy to do it. Pressamir, I think you have the next item on our agenda. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mayor um, and Councilors. Uh, just to kind of wrap up for, for Sean, um, you know, obviously uh, we're, we're a small town. I mean, the reality is, is we're 10,000 people and we have uh, limited resources, and especially a staff, but we try to leverage those as much as we possibly can. And I think in a lot of ways, um, it sometimes doesn't feel like we're such a small town because we are able to do a lot of things that uh, other communities can't. So appreciate um, all of Sean and his team's efforts. You'll be hearing more from other departments. I, I think Sean will probably have the longest presentation other than maybe a public works or police. Um, but uh, there's a lot of good work going on here and I want to make sure that you guys um, are, are aware of that. So uh, moving on to this resolution, uh, this is really straightforward. Um, this is just a resolution um, to repealing uh, primarily resolution 20-1535. Uh, that was a resolution that uh, happened after um, the mayor um, uh, proclaimed a, a emergency for COVID. Um, we found that as we went along that uh, there were some additional things that we could be prepared for to make sure that we were fast and flexible if needed. Um, I'm happy to say that I only issued one uh, executive order during uh, this period of time, and it was related to COVID somewhat, but it was actually more related to the wildfires. Um, people were sort of having a hard time finding a place to, to land, um, especially during COVID when people needed to stay apart from each other. So. Um, we did something there, but other than that, um, we were able to use the existing rules and um, laws that we had in place. We also had uh, opportunities to come to council as necessary since this kind of spread out over a long period of time. So anyway, um, you know, these are easy to put back in place if we need to. Um, the mayor can just simply um, declare another emergency if we need to for any reason, and if we need additional rules, uh, we have a template to bring that back. Um, but at the same time, um, if there isn't really a reason to continue it on, I don't have any um, inkling of any reason to be uh, issuing executive orders, which I couldn't bring to council um, in a timely manner. So um, at this point in time, we're just uh, asking to undo a couple things that we've done and, and move forward and, until um, we need to change them. So. And I will just say, I hope I never have to issue exec uh, emergency declarations again. <laughs> and so. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I don't see anybody jumping up and down with questions. It is, it is an action item. I move to adopt resolution 21-1555, proclaiming the termination of the state of emergency declared by the mayor on March 14th, 2020, and terminating additional authority granted to the city manager by resolution 20-1535. Second. I have a motion second discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, motion carries, thank you very much. And I just wanna say, I really have, um, you know, 
emergency declarations are never easy, and I really want to uh, call out Mr. Pesimir for um, working with these, finding ways to make things work with he and his staff. Um, having these tools in place has been helpful uh, in a number of different ways, both with COVID and wildfires, and uh, really appreciated his professionalism on working through this. This is uh, um, something you don't look forward to do, and you have in your red file on your desk at home, and uh, hopefully we will never have to use more again. So anyway, thank you. Um, anybody have any general counsel announcements? I do. Please. Um, I would just like to say thank you very, very much to citizen Don Hedrick Roden um, for the 4th of July parade. It was a big hit. Um, smiles everywhere. Uh, I, I was actually in the parade, so I got to see both Monmouth and Independence, and it was a great turnout, a uh, wonderful event, and I just wanted to say thank you for, for giving Thank you very much. Thank you very ride. much. Thank you for bringing that up. I just want to say that it was really a community-led event um, organized by community members. We had over 70 floats, 150-plus um, cars, two uh, F-15 flyovers, the flyover by the Independence Airport, um, thousands of people lining the street, and nothing but positive, positive feedback so far. So I just thank everybody for supporting that. Thank you. Additional comments, please. Um, just a, well, a, maybe a reminder to council and to other folks, the Independence Elks Lodge has its grand opening finally July 24th. That will be um, the, the groundbreaking itself at 4 o'clock and then followed by all sorts of fun festivities and food and beverages. So I would encourage all of our council members to come on down. If you have a shovel, bring it. Because um, <laughs> we're going to break some ground and build a new lodge. Yay. Congratulations. Yes, I have a couple of announcements. <laughs> First of all, the Independence Hop and Heritage Block Party will be back. It is September 18th. It is music, food, art, spirits, displays, and lots of community engagement. And the Ghost Walk will be back on October 2nd. Uh, we have, uh, I've already sent out the letters to businesses and um, you uh, perennial volunteers will be receiving information shortly about that. And I'm very <laughs> happy to take any other volunteers because we need site hosts, we need some help with organizing at the park, and we need just general floaters who might be willing to come in costume. And there is a new site this year, which is um, between Gilgamesh and the parking lot on the south side of the bank, which used to house an undertaker. And there are some very good stories there. Marilyn, what's the date of the Independence Her Hop and Heritage Block Party? September 18. Thank you. Okay. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. Somebody say adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor? Aye, All right. let's go. We're done. Thank you very much. Good to see everybody. Oh, thank you for being in person again. Yes. <laughs>